did. Yeah, I, uh, I tried to get uh, took advantage of the weather for a couple hours. How did I? How did I look? Uh, really good. Going up the hill, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> you know what? I always, uh, I hope an AED is always nearby. You never know. Yeah. You know, in the speaking of park, would it be helpful if we got a letter from the park about uh, supporting the speed limit thing on on uh, whatever it is, River Road? <clears throat> Greg, it's a question for you. Um, I think we could probably take that up with uh, our ODOT twelve representative. I'm not sure. I've never discussed that with him before. But uh, certainly, that could. I would think we that would carry about. some weight because a lot yeah. of it is, you know, bordered by the park. Well, that stretch. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that 40 stretch runs all the way to Route Six. It may even go north of Six. I'm not sure what the speed limit is there. Well, I'm just thinking the park's yeah. got a lot of involvement there, so I'm sure they'd support us. Both Brad at Chagrin North and, and Brian. Just the financially thought. support uh, the study you're thinking no, I'm or just in terms they of might. It's a possibility. I don't know how much we're talking about, but it'd be, be nice to know. Is that a Dave question? Yeah, I started talking to a couple engineers. Um it's looking to be around 15,000 to 18 you, to do a study. No kidding. Is it really that much? Wow. Yeah, it takes them, depending on what data is available, six months to do it, is my understanding, maybe six to eight months to do it all. Well, then once we get some prices, maybe it'd be a good thing to talk to Brian Zimmerman and see if he, we could get some support for him because they've got a lot of property park-wise that's involved in it. Maybe they would. All right, we are live streaming. Okay. Hey. Not quite five. Hi, Hadley, how are you? You're on mute. How's that? That's better. That's good, how are you? Real good, good to see you, Mayor. <clears throat> I like your background. Thank you. I'm trying to be and patriotic. Can, and it's right I, there. I can. <laughs> <laughs> it helps you spot me, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Do we know who this is on the phone, but no picture? Well, we, we can ask who uh, the last four digits are 6314. Uh -huh. and they might be on mute too. Please, um, up oh, there. Oh, hi, it's Ed Welsh. I'm on there. Hi, oh, Ed. hi, Ed. Okay. Hi. Hi, it, Scott. It starts... Hello. Hi, hi Scott. Hi, guys. Um, is it five? Uh, it is five. The bells are ringing here. Okay. If that's official. We can start now. Welcome, everybody. Howdy. Larry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, everyone has a copy of the agenda, I'm assuming. Yep. And we're going to start off with um, Chief uh, is going to talk about the Flock Safety uh, Program. Um, yes. So um, also with us on my screen top right is Rick Lombardo from Flock Safety, representative of Flock, Flock Safety here in Ohio. And um, I have met with Rick along with Sergeant Day over here. And um, we talked to him a couple different times. So um, probably a pretty good time to um, bring Rick in on this. So what we have looked at doing, trying to gain some support from the safety committee moving forward here. Um, so obviously um, um, we're hearing a lot about cameras now, not traffic cameras, we're hearing a lot about traffic cameras too, of course. But uh, Rick has a product here 
where it's more of a residential tool, more effective, I think, in terms of neighborhoods and whatnot. So um, many communities in our area are just starting to go to these. And I think Rick can touch on this a little bit more than me because he has the exact number and some of the agencies. I know Pepper Pike is going to these cameras. Honey Valley has a contract, I believe, in place with uh, Flock Safety right now. So I'm going to turn this over to Rick and uh, he can give us, uh, I think we've asked Rick to give us about a 10 minute briefing overview on the system itself. And um, we can talk about it after Rick's done. Thanks, Chief. Really appreciate it. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so yeah, as he mentioned, you know, Hunting Valley, they actually signed a contract with us for 25 of these cameras. So <coughs> moving forward with five of them. And uh, I'm on the, I live in Menor. So, you know, uh, Willoughby's coming with 10 and Eastlake asked for eight. Um, you know, Menor's looking at about 18. So hopefully a lot of these cameras will be showing up, you know, in, around you in, in the not so distant future. Um, to go into what our camera, cameras do, they're, they're a license plate reading camera. And to give you a background on how we even came about, our CEO, he was the president of his HOA down in Atlanta. And they had a couple of car break-ins, um, had some thefts of laptops, things of that nature out of cars. And everybody had, you know, security cameras and ring doorbells. Does everyone, anyone on this call have like ring doorbells or some sort of security camera at, at their house? Um, so a lot of them, you could get a picture of a car. So what happened down in Atlanta with, with our CEO and our founder, they had about five different houses. They all had ring doorbell cameras and they caught the suspect. It was a black truck. Um, they have five different angles of that black truck. Um, and they call the cops up. Uh, the cops come out. They all thought they solved the crime of the century, said, hey, here's, here's the black truck, go get them. And the cops pretty much told them, you know, there's nothing we can do with that. That's just a picture of a black truck. It's not because they didn't want to try and they're not, they're not putting in the effort. It's just very hard to just track down a vehicle with no license plate. Um, so our boss, he went and got a couple of quotes uh, for his neighborhood. And the lowest quote for about five cameras was close to $200,000. And that was just way too expensive. Um, so he's an electrical engineer by trade. Uh, bought a couple of iPhones offline, wrote up a program, put in a waterproof box and caught the guy in two weeks. Um, so it, it's just a way to really protect your city and your community uh, by almost having a direct pipeline straight to, straight to the police station. A lot of those crimes happen where people are thefts out of cars or stolen vehicles. They tend to enter your, your community in a stolen vehicle already to commit those crimes. So if one of those drives by one of the cameras, the, the police department would be notified within 15 seconds that a stolen car passed and it would say it, it's at this camera. Here's a picture of the car and the license plate. So then the, the police department knows where to go to, to, to stop that suspect before he has a chance to commit a crime. So you would be notified of any um, stolen vehicles, felony warrants, uh, sex offenders, uh, gang members, terrorists. There's 13 different things that will notify the police for um, as soon as they drive by one of those cameras. Um, so that's to, to use it proactively. Then reactively, um, the chief and his team will be able to use a lot of those ring doorbell cameras and things of that nature that are already in the community, uh, along with our system to help find out who that vehicle is. So if you did have someone uh, that was stealing from a garage or car break-ins, uh, home break-ins, and you have the ring doorbell and you can tell it's a, a silver uh, Honda Accord, uh, the chief would be able to go in and show them, say, hey, pull up every silver Honda Accord that came into our neighborhood in the past 12 hours with the license plate. So it's a lot easier to, to find that suspect uh, with, a, with a license plate. Um, not, hopefully that made sense to everybody uh, that's not familiar with license plate reading cameras at all. Uh, Rick, so do you want to talk about... Um where the data stored and costs, things of that nature? Yeah, so the, the cost is $2,500 per camera per year. And all the data is stored uh, on Amazon Web Services in a CGIS certified uh, cloud. And we only store the data for 30 days. Um, that's one of the things that we do a lot different than other license plate readers that are out there. Um, other license plate readers, they might, um, one for example is uh, Vigilant where they actually put cameras on the back of tow trucks and things like that. 
and pick up a bunch of data. And then in, on the back end, they'll sell that to a private citizen. So as a private citizen, I could buy your license plate for X number of years of everywhere that they've, that it's been parked at and that they were able to run that license plate. With ours, we only store the data for 30 days and the police department's the only one that has access to that, only law enforcement. Even internally, I wouldn't be able to access your system, even as an employee. Um, so it's, it's at a high level, you know, we only store it for 30 days, which takes away that big brother aspect that a lot of people in the community, you know, tend to get a little worried about that, you know, there's cameras all over that are tracking you all over the place. That's really not what we're doing. It's really just a tool for the community and the police department to utilize to help catch some catch, catch crimes before they happen and a really great investigative tool on the back end. And again, it's only stored for 30 days. The police department's able to download and save some of that if they're building a case. Um, but we're not continually storing people's data, you know, month after month after month. And with the $2,500 price point, that includes the hardware, the software, the LTE or the cell signal, and all the storage fees um, for everything with the cloud. There's a one-time uh, a one-time $250 install per camera. But other than that, you don't have anything to worry about. All the warranties, if anything breaks, we cover it. We come out and replace the camera. Um, you're just at $2,500 per camera per year. Okay, Rick, and there's, now there's solar, I believe? Yeah, there's solar powered. So that way you don't have to tie into electrical. Because um, a lot of the, the LPRs that are out there, you're forced to tie those in where there's already electric. Um, so you're really not putting them at the best places where with ours being solar powered, you're really able to put them anywhere throughout the city that you think would be that you'd find the best value in it. Rick, how do you determine uh, the location of each, you know, how many of these that you need? Um, so we would work with the police department to be able to come up, you know, obviously depending on funding, you know, where the best locations would be. My personal preference is I like to cover the ingress period. So every way that somebody can get into your, into your city, you're able to capture them. So if any crimes committed, um, you're able to pull that up. So, you know, show me everybody that came into the city in the last three hours that drove a black truck and pull it up that way. Um, so it's really up to the police department to really, and you know, you of course, to figure out how many you think you need and, and to figure out the right number. Um, for example, you know, Hunting Valley went really high at 25 and Pepper Pike started with five. Um, I think 25 is overkill, but um, you, obviously they had the money over there and it was not, a, not an issue in Hunting Valley. Um, I know not, not everyone is, has a gigantic checkbook, but. Quickly, are also, they installed? I'm sorry? How quickly are they installed or how we can get them in the ground in roughly about 45 days. We're right now between 30 and 45 days of an install period. I assume they must need an internet connection? Yes. Was well, that gonna be a problem if we mounted someplace, you know, remote at, a, at the edge of the village where there's no internet connection? Yeah, so we will test all of that ahead of time. So we will work with a multiple of different uh, vendors, whether it's AT&T, T-Mobile, and so on, to figure who has the best. Okay. And if we don't have a connection, we'll, we'll recommend moving it. Um, so we'll test all of that out prior to it being fully implemented and rolling out. So Rick, another nice feature, I remember Rick uh, explained to Sergeant Day and I, so if, if Honey Valley and Pepper Pike has, if we want to go into their system as well and pull up their data, we would have that ability. Is that correct, Rick? That is correct. And to tell you, I just talked with Chief Cannon. So you'll actually have several different ways to view cameras of people leaving um, um, your, your area. So for example, Hunting Valley actually has one um, coming from Gates Mills on 91 on Chagrin River and on um, one more uh, county line road. So anyone that leaves the city, leaves Gate, Gates Mills and County Line, you'll have access to those cameras. Hey, hey Rick, how often can you, can you move them? Okay. If crime moves to a different area yeah, of town, can you move them? Is it 250 each time? Um, yes, it is 250 each time to move them. However, if you have existing city light poles, they can go on. Um, 
relatively easy to move them. Um, they're just kind of bolted on. So your city works, people would be able to kind of unbuckle it if it's on an existing light pole. Obviously it's a little different than us sinking a pole in the ground because um, you're able to hang them on existing street lights, utility poles or our own flock pole. Um, so there's a couple of different ways for us to hang them originally, um, but you are able to move them. I don't want to tell you, 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 you can't that they're stuck wherever they're at forever. Um, but we also don't recommend just constantly moving them all the time. It's, you really get the best results by kind of keeping them in one area where there is some crime or the, the main entry points in. Um, that just tends to work the best. You know, so uh, Serge Dana, we've been talking a lot about this and you know, this is, you know, we, we just throw things out back and forth. So when you look back at the history, when I say history, most recent history, I'm gonna say about five years. When you go back five years, the most serious crime, I guess, you could say we have had has been up in the Gates Mills Boulevard area where it's quick in, quick out, right? Into Mayfell Heights, jumping on the freeway and whatnot. So we looked at that and I think we came up, if we wanted to try to do our best to lock down that whole area up there, the residential side streets up on Chartley, Dorchester, um, Gates Mills Boulevard, both East and West. Um, right. We think... <clears throat> it would probably take about four cameras and that whole area would be protected. Is that correct, Mike? Yeah, because we were talking about West Hill Old Mill area too. We could probably do four with the right placements. We, we'd have to be able to do, we don't want to overlap anything. So um, that's what we'd work with Rick on to find out exactly where we can get the best angles from. Are any of the other uh, communities around us South seems to be covered and a little bit Pepper Pike to the West. What about Mayfield Village, Mayfield Heights? Willoughby Hills. Even, yeah, Willoughby Hills, Chesterland. Uh, so <clears throat> um, they don't have them yet. Now, Willoughby Hills, there's a little transition right now because their chief's retiring and there's just no one to kind of make a decision right now. Um, as for Mayfield and Mayfield Heights, I did just meet uh, with them the other week. Um, at a, a, a meeting with about seven chiefs at it. Um, now they have a different program through Cuyahoga County. Um, so they got some grant money, but they're paying 30,000 per camera and it can only capture one lane. So I know that Mayfield Heights, for example, I was told um, that they spent six figures just covering Mayfield Road both ways. Um, and it's license plate only for those cameras. Plate only. It can't identify the make, model, and, and build of a car. Are they locked into a, a, a contract or? So they, the, what the Kiowa County does is a little different than the platform that they use. So you actually purchase the camera, then there's a much smaller annual fee to it. So the camera is roughly, you know, 15 to 30 grand. It has to be electrical and so on. Um, whereas we're really license plate readers as a service. Um, so if their cameras go down, they're responsible for maintaining them. You know, once, you know, five years pass, they're outdated, they have to buy new cameras and so on. Um, so there's a, a little bit different. They actually purchase the cameras outright, then just have to pay the LTE and some a small minor fee. There's, there's no problem. Village? Mayfield Village? Correct, yeah. So Cuyahoga County came out with a program years ago that had grants through the Department of Homeland Security. So none of them actually, like Mayfield, to my knowledge, didn't actually pay for any of them. They all came through a grant um, several years ago. Well, Mayfield Heights is separate from Mayfield Village. So Mayfield Heights, oh, sorry. Mayfield Heights has the cameras. Mayfield Village has them also. Yeah, I don't really mute this. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if Mayfield has them. Um, I know that Mayfield Heights does on Mayfield Road. Yeah, yeah Mayfield Heights has, um, you know, there, there's several of Mayfield and Sound. You have them on 91. They have on Cedar and Landerbrook. That's different than what this product is. That's, um, yeah, that, that's through the county. And, you know, those are uh, pretty big buck items right there. So I there's think no issue. I was going to say, are there any more questions that Rick had? One of the things that um, before we ask him any questions, I think it's important that we check the, the sites, the prospective sites, to make sure that there's um, decent enough internet 
because there's so many areas in the village that have weak internet and it goes in and out. Is that possible to do? Yep. Yeah, we'd be able to check for, for any of the internet. Is there yeah, any evidence that communities who've had this for a while, it, there becomes a deterrent effect? Yeah, so multiple studies have been done. Um, one study in Ohio that was done by the Dayton PD, um, they had our cameras. <clears throat> and after a, a six month period, um, they saw a 43% reduction in crime. Um, and that's twofold. Um, one, you're catching a lot of the bad guys, getting them off the streets. And then two, bad guys talk to other bad guys and printers say, you know, if you have a stolen car <clears throat> and you enter Gates Mills, you know, they're on you within 15 seconds of you entering. Um, a lot of uh, departments I talked to said, well, they're just going to run from us. You know, I, I met with Menor and they said, well, they're just going to run from us. And I say, that's fine. You know, eventually they're, you might not pull them over, but eventually they're going to know that they can't enter your city without immediately having the cops on them. Um, and that's really what it is. It's really, you know, a security system for the city is the way I, I kind of view it. Um, you know, you don't want to use your security system constantly catching bad guys. You want to eventually just have it be as a, as a big deterrent that people know that you can't take a stolen car in there or a vehicle that's, you know, yours to commit a crime in because you're going to be caught on film. There's no, there's no issue picking up tags at nighttime, correct? Like three or four in the morning, it'll pick up the tag. Yep. Yeah, we do. Work on it. We're about 92% accurate at night, 96% uh, accurate on make, build, and color in, during the day. We're definitely not perfect. Nobody. Um, the LA County Sheriff's did do a study on us, and we are 30% more accurate than any of the other LPRs on the market. Excellent. Thank you. Rick, um, just the uh, battery storage life, and you know, sometimes it's not too sunny around here. I mean, you're getting good results even in not in LA. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have tons of cameras in the Chicago area, Boston, you know, Dayton, Indianapolis. Uh, we got a lot of cameras up north. Um, we put double battery backups on the cameras. Um, so we could go almost seven plus days without a charge um, and, and still be able to read. Okay. We also have a full operations team um, that they'll maintain the health of the camera. They get four updates a day. Um, so if for any reason the camera's battery is getting low or anything like that, we'll we'll know before you do almost. Okay. That's good to know. If there are no other questions, I, I think that we should have uh, our Chief Minichello and Karen Schneider, our mayor, get together and, and discuss this and uh, kind of move forward if, if people are thinking that this is, you know, where the way to go. This is a manpower multiplier. Okay. <laughs> Eyes and ears. Yep. So um, why don't we go on? Thank you, Rick, for presenting. We appreciate that. Uh, can next I up, ask a question? It's Ed Wolf. Ed? Can I ask a question? It's Ed Wolf. Sure. Um, would you open that program up to private individuals that maybe buy their own camera and, and attach it to your network? I know if you go up to Best Buy, you can pay up to $2,000 for one of those networks. If you had one of those cameras on your property, you know, overlooking the street, uh, our village people might be interested in, you know, adding a camera at their own expense. Yes, uh, we do work with the private sector. About a third of our cameras are actually purchased by HOAs, condo associations, shopping centers, hospitals, schools, things of that nature. Um, so we're very big in the HOA market. Um, constituents tend to, to really like the product. You know, that if you have a cul-de-sac or a, some place that you have one entrance, you know, you stick a, a camera in front and it feeds right into the police station. Would that be a separate contract yeah, from give, the village contract? It would, give them per, yeah, it would give them personal protection along with add another value to, you know, the camera system for the village. Correct. Yeah. Um, so it would be a separate contract with a private entity. Okay, thank you. It'd be interesting to put or have a brochure about that from a private standpoint. I'm sure we have a few residents that would go for that. And then the whole community could maybe benefit from it. So I don't know if you have something like that, but it would be nice to have it. Yeah, I, I can send an introduction over. I got a colleague of mine that I, I, I work with strictly law enforcement in Ohio. He works with strictly the private sector for the HOAs and members of the community. Um, so we're happy to put together, you know, any 
you know, like lunch and learns, things of that nature, where if people want to come out and take a look at the product, show you what it does, we're happy to kind of put together those, those types of things. Maybe a community thing and let the community uh, see or have access to it. Maybe some of them would like it. I, I, I think we have a few people that would like it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that leads us to our next subject, which is crime prevention officer and programming for the community. So that is, we will discuss that as we get into that. Thank you. Um, Rick, I'll be in touch with you. You know, you could certainly leave okay. if you so choose to. Yep. It's up to you. Yeah, if but any other, I'll be in touch with it. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, if any other questions yeah, Rick. or anybody needs anything from me, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me at any point. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Rick. Rick. Thanks Rick. Uh, so just uh, moving right along, as uh, Larry mentioned, crime prevention officers. So we have uh, one of our officers, Patrolman Jessica Newsom, signed up to be our certified crime prevention officers, three-day training. And um, it's something we believe that uh, she'll do a great job with. We think it's right up her alley. She's got uh, great people skills. She wants to get out in the community and do these types of things. So what it's going to allow her to do is get the latest information on how you know communities, residents, businesses can protect themselves, protect their businesses. Um, and our goal with this would be if you know start promoting it once she goes through the training. Um, they can reach her directly. They can set up an appointment with her. You know she can go over their house. She can talk to them. You know there's all sorts of things we can do with this. So um, she is slated to go to training. It is the end of this month. And uh, she's pretty excited about it. And we've never had a certified crime prevention officer down here before. So um, we think it's a good thing for us. We really do. So um, she'll be very successful in that role. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to sending her through the training. So Greg, she, am, am I correct that she's going to be um, in charge of doing like community education if we have a community? Yeah, she'll do a lot of it. That's the goal. Um, she's, she's very strong in that area right now. As, as well as some of our other officers, but um, you know, we believe this is, uh, you know, this is she's most very effective in this role. So she's going to be taking a lot of those responsibilities over. So you may want to mention to her the idea of the flock system um, for private residents, and maybe she yes. can talk to Rick. Um, one of the other things that we had discussed at the Long Range planning meeting is reviewing alarm systems and having some community education on the different types of alarm systems. Um, as the safety committee may, may have heard the, um, through the long range planning committee, we had discussed the systems that are now being monitored are rather obsolete. And we've proposed a, a sunset law or a sunset end date of funding um, the village paying for uh, monitoring. Um, so it'd be interesting to, you know, once she's up to, to speed that we can get some information about the different types of alarm systems, piggyback on um, private residents having cameras and, and that sort of thing. Yep, I agree with you. Okay. Any other comments or questions about the crime prevention officer? Okay, next, uh, Greg, you wanna discuss the body cameras? Um, yes, so we did uh, apply for a grant um, this year. We were unsuccessful in receiving funding for it. So um, that's still there. Um, it's something I think we're interested in, but um, you know, so it always comes down to funding, right? So um, that's the bottom line here. So me personally, I believe that uh, we should focus our funding efforts on the flock safety camera systems. I really do. I think that has more of a wide ranging community value, more so than the body cameras. Um, the body cameras are great. I'd love for every officer to have one. Um, they're expensive. However, we do have the onboard, the dashboard cameras in the cruisers. So we do have a level of protection, not only for the, you know, for the, for the officer, but the motoring public as well. Most of it occurs on camera. It's not gonna catch everything off camera, but we'll still have the audio. So um, once again, would I love to have both? Absolutely, I'd love to have both. But I think we will be successful at some point down the road in acquiring some grant funding to, um, to get 
to have the officers equipped with the body cameras. I think it's going to be, it, we're not that far away to be standard uniform equipment. And I would be surprised if um, within two, three years, we start seeing every officer in the state of Ohio with a body camera, mandatory. So we're not there yet. So I think we can afford to be a little bit patient there, see if we can get some, you know, receive some grant funding to purchase these body cameras. And if not, I think we'll, you know, it'll, it'll be mandated and the state would have to release some funding for it. Is that usual, usually federal funding, county funding, state funding? Well, it, it could be either. So, um, but there is a movement right now to have in, in the state of Ohio to have all officers equipped with uh, a body camera. Okay. But we're not there yet. Okay. Next we have a resident camera database. Yeah, so this is, I'm gonna just kind of circle back and tie this in with uh, our crime prevention officer so um, what we're talking about here is, and it's been touched on many times already, like a lot of the residents here have camera systems, ring cameras, nests, there's all kinds of things going on. So um, one of the responsibilities I like to have Officer Newsom take care of is um, trying to find out who has these systems and try to keep an internal database. So when we do have something, a crime or something we need to check into, we'll know. You know, so right now we, you know, we get a crime, you know, we had, as I think everybody knows, we had a couple of burglaries, we're stopping out at each house, we're doing area canvases, and time is money and resources and everything. So, you know, we don't mind doing that. But if we know certain residents have these cameras, we can go right to them to see if they, in fact, were able to pick something up in their neighborhood and their cameras. So, um, once again, it's, it's a community we think you know, some strong community relations there. We think it's a good idea. We think the resident would be forthcoming and letting us know if they do have a camera system. And if they do, we can contact them and you know, go up there. Um, they could certainly take a look and see if they did see anything. So that's just some, uh, some ideas that we had moving forward. And it would only be accessible to the officers. Obviously we create an internal database somehow. We certainly get uh, Sergeant Day involved in that so, um, you know, we like the idea. We think there's some value there and uh, there's no cost to it whatsoever. And if the resident doesn't want to share that with us, that's fine. Hey, Chief, this is Mike. I, I love the idea. I, we've got cameras in my house and I, I, I need to keep them charged. I don't keep them charged. So if I knew that uh, it would help, you know, and that you guys have a list of them, I'll keep them charged all the time then. So I, I like the idea. Yeah, so it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting it out there, you know, reaching out, passing it on to the officers to kind of mention, you know, it's just like anything, it just takes time to build up that database. That would also be a great uh, thing for our crime prevent prevention officer to encourage. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, also if we, if we, when she does the, um, education about alarms uh, oftentimes video is tied in with alarm systems um, she could certainly you know get that onto her agenda so just uh, kind of since we're on this we're jumping ahead a little bit but sergeant dan and i were discussing some dates this morning and we're going to try to pin down what do we say mike monday the 24th of november i believe we're going to try uh, to have a virtual 23rd is that correct mike? was that the date 23rd 23rd it was okay monday so yes we're, we're going to try to have we try to do something of you at the community house safety presentation whatever we're going to go ahead and do we can't do that this year next door because of the covid obviously so um, we're looking to uh go to the resident with this so on 11 23 between six and seven you know we'll have links and we'll get the information out there and we'll see um you know who joins in and we'll provide some safety information we'll talk about all the programs we can get the word out about you know, the database, some of the things that we're looking at. So we're really hoping to get that done in November. Great. Would you like to discuss officer first aid training? Um, yes, yeah. so as of five o'clock this evening, all of our full-time police officers are retrained and fully certified with CPR, first aid, tourniquets, everything. So I'd like to thank Tom, Fire Chief Robinson certainly assisted us in getting this done. 
Uh, Fire Chief Majeski was uh, one of the instructors, did a great job. We have a registered nurse, Kitty Gabram from Hillcrest Hospital, who helps us with that. And uh, Mike Feig also did a great job in, um, you know, doing his part with training the officers on tourniquet usage and whatnot. So we had two sessions with that back to back. Well, we had six officers go last week. We had six go this week. So everybody's caught up to speed. That trains every two years. Do we ever have that for the community? Um, we, we have not. Tom, I see you kind of maybe. We did. Yeah, we, 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 we did that a couple of years ago. We opened it up okay. uh, and had people sign up okay. and come to the fire station. And we did the, um, the CPR AED uh, training uh, with COVID, you know. Yeah. And this stuff is on hold, you know. But once we get through this, you know, I think it's it's a great uh, community outreach, and and I think we'll do it again. It's just I can't give you the uh, the timetable for that happening. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and then we wanted to discuss uh, the last issue is uh, the overview of fines and enforcement. Um, yes, so we've been we've been looking at this, and I think one of the main reasons we would like to consider uh, possibly increasing our um, fines now is because last year Lyndhurst Court increased their fines, and so we are still lower than Lyndhurst Court. So um, they went up about fifteen or twenty dollars, and um, we're looking to recommend doing the same thing, just to stay lower but yet on par and still giving um, you know, the, the, the violator an advantage of paying here rather than go to court. So um, you know, I think we're looking at that. We'll need some council approval to do that, but that's something that uh, Sergeant Day and I have been discussing. I know you, have, you had revised the information that you give uh, out with a violation. Do you wanna- Yes, yes we did. Mike, do you wanna pick up on that, Mike? Yeah, what, what had happened is uh, Lynnhurst Court uh, began taking payments online. And the way they do it is even before they received the citation, the violator could enter their own information with the ticket and take a payment before the court even receives the ticket. So because of that, we revised our handout to encourage um, making payments at Gates Mills versus having it go through Lynnhurst Court. Um, the intention was not to be selfish or anything like that, but being that the violations belong here, we thought it was best to try and keep them here. Um, so we basically, it was just very slight rewording. Uh, we changed it from a 10 day grace period to a 12 day to make a payment. And uh, we just basically put the information on the form to reflect Gates Mills Mayor's Court versus anything to do with Lynnhurst Court. Another um, area that we had discussed at the long range planning uh, was additional police enforcement. Um, and some of our residents had, uh, had concerns about uh, speed, speed violations, noise violations, and uh, it actually recommended a uh, possibility of traffic cameras, perhaps on Mayfield, where there seemed to be a lot of uh, speeding going on. Uh, any comments on that, either Mike or Greg? Well, you know, that, you know, once again, um, that, that's a pretty sensitive area. You know, we start talking traffic cameras. Um, I, obviously, uh, 322 comes to mind. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, um, some of which is very negative, as I think everybody has some familiarity with when you look at some of these other communities who do have those cameras. Um, you know, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, if the council would want to recommend, you know, we can always do a presentation on that, but uh, they're not very well received by the public. There's no question about it. There's no discretion along with those either. I mean, um, you know, Everybody you come across is going to go ahead and receive a ticket. Doesn't matter who you are. 
and uh, there's nothing we can do about it, nor that we should anyways. But, um, you know, everybody has to, you know, there's, there's re the reviewing of every single traffic citation takes tremendous amount of time. And quite honestly, I don't think we have the resources to do that right now. If we ever went in that direction, you know, we're, we're pretty, you know, we're, it's, we're static with our staffing and we do a great job, but when you start increasing volume like that, you know, something's got to give and we'd have to hire somebody else to, uh, you know, to, to work with us with that. In fact, you know, in, in fact, like you mentioned Willoughby Hills a couple of times, they have one full-time person dedicated only to that. Not, not the traffic cams, but their mayor's court. So we kind of piece everything together. It's a pretty big job. But um, once again, um, there's a, uh, you know, there, there is a negative perception out there with, uh, with the public when it, come, when it comes to traffic cameras, no question about that. I just wanted to mention that because you know that had come up in in our, in our long range planning meeting. So I just wanted the safety committee uh, to be aware of that. Um, so we've covered a lot of areas um, for the police department. Does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns? Like to add anything? Well, good. That means Greg, you did a great job of filling everyone in. And uh, I, on behalf of the safety committee, I, I think we're all very happy with the way our police department runs and, and the uh, security that you give us all in the village. Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, and I think everybody knows this, but certainly, you know, I'm accessible all the time. Anybody who has any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, if we don't have the answers, we'll certainly find them for you. And if they can't find you in the village, they can find you in the park running up the hill. <laughs> I saw him today. I'm keep, about keep, done running keep it in shape. That's good. <laughs> keep it in shape. Okay, now we'll go to Chief Robinson, our fire department. Um, he has uh, the first on your agenda is the EMS contract update. Yes, uh, the, the contract will be reviewed uh, at the council meeting tomorrow night. It, it has been uh, through the law directors for both communities. So we are now at a point where we would need council action to, uh, to enter into this uh, three-year. This one is a three-year agreement with options on two more years. And uh, our, our previous one, the one that we're, we're finishing up now, was a, a five-year. But uh, Mayfield Village wanted to just go with a three with, uh, with options for a year four and a year five. So with that comes increases. Uh, we, we, we looked at a lot of, um, we tried to look at every alternative. Um, and, and the problem with, with this, um, this situation is that with EMS, you need obviously high quality service, but you also need it fast. So that does limit who can provide that for our village. In other words, you know, contracting out with someone that's, you know, 15 minutes away is certainly out of the question. You know, you're, you're not going to survive a, a heart attack. So we, we are somewhat limited in who can provide us that service in a timely fashion, which makes contract negotiations from our end extremely difficult. Um, but uh, the mayor and I and a number of other people, uh, our, our, uh, our finance director, uh, Janet, all worked very hard on, on these, uh, these negotiations as hard as any year. And I've been involved with this for, for quite a few years now. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it, looked at every possible alternative source. And, and it, it, it's, it's very quick that you come to the realization that even though this is what I consider to be a, a, a significant increase in cost, um, it's still in the best interest of our residents to continue this relationship with Mayfield Village. Do you want to come in on, on the increase of, um, from the old contract to the new contract? Does everyone have no. an idea how, how they raised the, the fee? Um, well, 
being the council hasn't seen, well, council should have seen it. It went out in the packet on Friday. I think and it's I'm safe sure to go where, ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure where Mayfield Village is with their council because it's got to go before them. But um, our estimated, our probably the easiest way to put it is in in uh, 2019, our costs were capped at about 185 five. $185,500 for EMS. And that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In, in 2021, the first year of the contract, estimated costs um, are going to be about 317. So you have to deduct the, uh, the money we get through billing from that. So if you, if you deduct our average amount of uh, refund, if you will, from billing out, um, the cost increase for 21 will be to the village will be about $77,000. And we are looking at some other uh, cost containment um, measures with uh, the mayor and our law director. So if the call volume stays where it is, you know, we would anticipate uh, about $77,000 in increases in 21. Um, it'll go up to 86,000 in 22 and 96,000 in 23, third year of the contract. And we did get a few concessions for the contract. No, we, we, uh, made, we made some real headway in an area that, that was very concerning to me that's been in the contract for quite a few years, a number of contracts, and, and that was um, in the area of traffic accidents with multiple releases. So if there's a, a, a two-car crash with four people, two in one car, two in the other car, the current contract, not the one that we're getting ready to, to agree to, but that current contract, when we call for an ambulance, it costs us per patient, okay? Um, even if the patients sign off on a release form and don't want to be transported or treated, each patient costs the same amount. Now, in the, in the 2021, in this new contract, that, that per patient cost would be $2,000. So we would incur this, this cost of, you know, four times $2,000 for that one crash. And what we were able to do uh, with negotiations with Mayfield Village is take it down from $2,000 per person that signs a release to $250. Um, and and uh, that, that my nightmare scenario has always been a school bus or two and having 60 patients all sign off. You know, the, the, the uh, economic impact, financial impact on the village would be substantial. So that is uh, one of the really good things that I think uh, it's fair. I think it, it's very fair. And, uh, and Mayfield Village agreed to it. And also the billing that we have a little bit more control with billing as it relates to Gates Mills, which, which we're gonna be addressing in the near future. Mm -hmm. Good. I know you guys uh, uh, spent a lot of time negotiating the, the, the new contract and it wasn't easy. So. Okay, any questions about the EMS or the contract? Nothing from YouTube. Okay. So 2020 State Fire Marshal Citizen Hero Award. Yes. This yeah. uh, this this, uh, this, this stems is from an incident, yeah. Yeah. Uh, an incident that took place on March 1st of this year. Um, one of our residents, uh, there was a car crash in front of his house. The car hit a boulder, turned on its side, um, on the passenger side and then uh, subsequently caught on fire. The resident heard the crash about three o'clock in the morning or so, ran out, the driver of the car was able to self-extricate. 
the passenger was trapped in the car with it on fire and on the side. So the, the, the windshield had a hole in it from the crash. He, he actually reached into the broken glass and tried to enlarge that window opening to pull the victim out and couldn't do it. Um, windshields are really tough. We use special tools to cut through those. So he ran back into his house, got a sledgehammer, and he enlarged the opening and pulled that woman out of that burning car. All of this took place before the police department arrived uh, or the fire department or EMS arrived. So he did this you know, at, at great risk to himself. Um, so what, what I did was I nominated him uh, for an award, a citizen's award uh, through the state fire marshal's office and they they review all of the nominees and and uh you know there's a lot of paperwork it's like with anything involved and i was very pleased when i got notified that he had indeed been selected so he and his family will actually meet with the state fire marshal um next week and be presented uh, an award, a Citizens Hero Award for the actions that he took that, that early morning. Um, the mayor will be presenting a, a proclamation to him. And I believe that uh, Senator Dolan uh, is going to also have something, uh, an award uh, for him. But you know, it was, uh, it was in my pink sheet article or it was my pink sheet article, so most people if you read the pink sheet, hopefully you do, should should be aware of this. Um, and and again, it's it it's a, it's a shame that um, this year COVID has changed everything. Previous years, the the recipients of these awards were brought down to Columbus, and and they have a big awards dinner, and and it it's a big deal. Uh, but with COVID. What the state fire marshal's office did uh, to stay in line with the uh, governor's orders is they offered you two choices. One was we'll do it virtually, kind of like what we're doing here, or the state fire marshal will come up and present the award in person, limiting that group to 10. Um, so, so that's what uh, Mr. Paporis uh, elected for the in-person, and, and we are setting that up for our community center with the proper precautions and limitations in people and masks, social distancing all in place. But it, it's, it's really, I think it, it speaks very well of our residents. We'll take pictures and film it. Oh, great. Really nice. That's excellent. And that takes us to the 2020 Fire Hydrant Program Winter Update. Yes, the red bags are coming. The red bags are coming. Uh, just so you're aware, this is year two of this uh, pilot program I instituted, which is uh, we, we actually put red bags over the fire hydrants along Mayfield Road. What we've noted in the last quite a few years is the, and, and I don't know whether it's because of the use of brine or the, uh, or the salt concentrate, but we're seeing a lot of damage to the fire hydrants along Mayfield Road. You know, uh, not saying anyone's speeding, but the speeds are higher. And when the cars are picking up all of that, that brine, it's deposited all over the fire hydrants and we're having to have them replaced on a, on a, on a you know, they really should be almost a lifetime of use. And what we're seeing is three, maybe four years and they're corroded so badly that they have to be replaced. So last year we started the program. I did clear it with uh, Cleveland Division of Water and we bag them in the fall, leave them bagged through the whole winter and, uh, and then remove, it in the, remove them in the spring. So what you will be seeing along Mayfield Road are uh, the red bags returning. Uh, doesn't mean they don't work, they work absolutely fine. But it, it does seem to, uh, after only one year, the first year, uh, it's a noticeable difference. So it, it, I think it's a, it's a great thing. It's, uh, it's always a hazard when they have to come and shut down uh, one of the lanes on Mayfield Road to do those kind of jobs. So the less that happens, the better also. 
we want the hydrants working and we don't want traffic accidents while they're trying to do the replacement of them. Can I ask a quick question about that? I find that very interesting because I always assume when I see that, that the hydrant doesn't work. Is there, maybe there has been and I've missed it. That would be a great article for the pink sheet to explain it's still working, we're just protecting it. And maybe you've done that and I've missed it. I'm not sure if I did it last year or not, but I will, because I'm always looking for something to put in the pink sheet. <laughs> so that's, you know, good idea, that's, that's, that's a good idea. idea. And that's I, coming up very quickly. And, and you're right, generally the out of service hydrants, uh, and this is usually when they're doing the install or a major change, is a black bag. Um, so the Cleveland Water, which is why we went with red, not just because it's fire department, but what we wanted to make sure was uh, when I cleared it with Cleveland Water, I said, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna go with red bags. You can keep using your black bags. Um, the fire hydrants that are out of service, you know, in Gates Mills, either have a, a large placard on them, or you'll see like the, uh, the fire line tape wrapped around the hydrants so that we know that that hydrant's out of service. And then the other marking that's specific to Gates Mills is our hydrants are generally green and the big connection on the front has a big cap on it. And if that cap is painted yellow in Gates Mills, that means that that hydrant services a house that's more than a thousand feet away, which means- This is gonna be an amazing article. I mean, this, <laughs> this might take two pages. It's very yeah. interesting. I mean it. So it's we great. A lot of time in planning. You know, there aren't a lot of fires, so we plan everything. <laughs> there's there's method to the madness. And Tom, the, the, this red bag idea was yours, wasn't it? Yeah. So are you going to are you going to like to, if this works? Are you going to let other departments know that it's preserving the fire hydrants or? Well, you know, I, after we did it last year, I got a lot of phone calls, mostly from people in the fire service that drive on Mayfield Road, uh -huh. saying, what's going on with their fire hydrants? <laughs> so there, there actually are a number of people in the fire service that have taken note. Um, uh, you know, for us, it, it's a specific problem on that road. Uh, we don't bag any of the other hydrants because we haven't had we haven't had the problem with with yeah. corrosion. Mm -hmm. So some are aware, and, and and again, usually it's a firefighter driving down Mayfield, saying, "What's going on with your fire hydrants?" We'll, we'll all look forward to the pink sheet article. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for that, Karen. Uh, and then there are two last items, shared items: the COVID nineteen continuity of operations and the rescue task force and school training. So yeah, I, I, both I our chiefs can talk to that. Yeah, and I, I did talk with Greg about that and we really hadn't had a uh, safety committee meeting uh, since all of this started, the COVID-19. And I just thought it would be good for, for our departments to kind of say, well, here's some of the measures that we we instituted so that we could continue our operations, alter them, but but continue them. And and as you you know watch TV or read the papers or go on the internet, we're seeing another possible uh, second round. So it's it's I think equally important for us to continue what we're doing. Uh, the fire department initially we we canceled our training because I really can't afford to have all of my firefighters here in the same room and then all get sick. Um, and uh, Dave made uh, changes to the schedule for the service department, which he could speak to. Um, we of course are using masks and we are sanitizing vehicles. We, we have somewhat limited our uh, exposures with the public. So the department didn't do a lot of things. We, we switched our training early on to Zoom so we did all of it, you know, which is very difficult in the fire service to do. There's a lot you can teach uh, on Zoom, but a lot of it is hands-on. So we did start uh, the beginning of the year off with uh, only Zoom training. We have transitioned back to in-person training 
And what we're doing is small group. So we're, we're breaking them down into groups of no more than four. And, and everyone is, you know, wearing their masks like they're supposed to and, um, and doing all of the sanitizing of the rigs and the equipment that we wear, um, which, which is, you know, part of our time, our training time is now getting eaten up in, in cleaning time. It used to be just polish the truck. Now it's clean the steering wheel and the microphone button. And uh, Greg, I don't know if you had, uh, I, I know that the police department is using masks and social distancing. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're doing what we should be doing. Um, we, we have had uh, a couple of our officers infected uh, over time. One was right in the beginning and, um, you know, nothing that was contracted here at the station. Um, and then uh, we did have another one uh, more recently. Um, they've been fine and uh, recovered and, you know, we certainly supported them and getting back, uh, you know, helping them through throughout the entire process really and then um getting them back on their feet and supporting them and uh, you know they're back uh in the department right now and everything's going fine but uh, you know once again you know we're doing everything that we can do you know we're spacing the, spacing the officers out as much as we can um obviously it's a small building so you gotta kind of go with what you got uh, we're trying to limit limit the people in the station as much as possible um you know we have a pretty strict car policy. So we're not really using the same car every shift type of thing. So we're staggering those, which is very beneficial. We're wiping them down. Um, you know, they have all the PP equipment that they need. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, everybody's done a nice job. We just gotta get over this challenging time. You know, um, people come in and file reports to the station. We've been taking some of those over the phone where we can trying to limit the exposure risk for everybody we'll go outside you know you may have seen us we, we'll take reports right down there in the playground you know we've done that weather permitting so um you know whatever we have to do we're going to go ahead and continue to do so but um you know we're not immune from anything as just like anybody else um so um we we have delayed our school programs we try to get them to schools a lot you know, we're, we're making some appearances, but they have been caught way back. We don't plan to do any you know, live dare instruction this year for obvious reasons. We want to try to, you know, that that's a su successful program, but we need to do that live and in person. You know, I'm not into interested in any kind of, you know, Zoom presentation or anything like that. Um, if it continues to go on, then we can look at doing something like that in the spring. But, um, so we're doing some walkthroughs with the schools, but we're just doing them on a limited basis now, nowhere near than uh, what we did last year. So, um, but the schools are, they've done a great job. I mean, changes day to day. We have great communication with all of our school leaders and every school is a little bit different. So, um, you know, they had their challenges as well. So, but uh, we're you know, working together. We're just uh, you know doing the best we can with what we have to work with right now. But uh, we're getting through everything. I know uh, Mike Pinto. I'm going to kind of get Mike involved in this a little bit. Mike and I have been doing some talking. So I know in his office, Mike's with the Cleveland Division of the FBI, and Mike has seen this go around his office as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is uh, it's hard to avoid. Um, we're, uh, 95 masks whenever we're meeting with anybody. Um, but you know, you, you still got to work. So we're, we're still out in the street and we're, we're gloved up, masked up, doing the best we can. We, uh, you know, try to limit anybody we bring in the office, but, um, you know, we're back to full, we've always been back to full work, but, um, we're, uh, I think I, everybody in the office now is back in full, um, full time. So it's, uh. Yeah, it's challenging, but, uh, you know, we're getting through it. Yeah. Challenging times. But by next year, we should be better. That's so. Is there anything, oh. uh, any, anything else that we need to discuss that has anything on anybody's mind or concerns? The only, the only thing left on the agenda was that uh, the rescue task force. Ah, okay, yes. And, and really what that was is... Um, 
we, through uh, the schools, were, were working toward uh, doing some in-school training, and that doesn't involve really the staff or students. It involved the police department and fire departments working together. Uh, and, and this is really kind of your active shooter scenario. Um, and obviously because of uh, COVID, the schools don't want a lot of people in, this, in, in there. And, and we really don't want the exposure either. So that kind of just, um, that's on the back burner. It will happen, uh, but it's, it's on, a, on a, a brand new timetable. And at the elementary school, are kids back in school? Are they part-time, virtual, or what now? Um, yes, so Gates Mills Maple Schools are, are back in live. Um, you may have read last, uh, was, uh, Mayor, was it about two weeks ago or even last week? They had a big outbreak up at Maple Middle School on Psalm. I think there were 90 students, I believe, if right. I remember. Right, that are quarantined. Yeah. One that was sick, is my understanding, but 90 that got quarantined. Right. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it down here a little bit, um, you know, at the elementary school, the Gates Mills Elementary School. Um, as you know, our officers in, in the school some time there and then we'll go up north to the environmental center and um you know they have a strict policy on that he's masked up every day and uh don't we can enter the school without a mask and you know staff they're all masked up gloved up they're taking all the precautions they can and um so they're doing a nice job there at the elementary school um st francis they're also all the students are back uh, I think their enrollment picked up. I think there's, you know, with the private schools going on right now, I think, you know, they've seen an uptick in enrollments. I know that that happens to be the case too with Gilmore. And Gilmore's done a great job too. I was just up there the other day. Um, they, they, uh, they, they're very organized with this. Um, so like in the administration, all the administrators are working like every other day. So, you know, the building's half full, um, Everybody's wearing masks. All the students are wearing masks. You know, they have markers on all the floors. Um, you know, there's hand sanitizing stations all over the place. I mean, it, they've, it's pretty neat how they got it. They, they put a lot of time. So Kathy's done a great job up there. She takes it very seriously. And um, so all the schools are in pretty good shape right now from what I'm able to tell. Good. All right. If there's nothing else to discuss, I'd uh, like to thank every member of the safety committee for coming to our meeting virtually and both Chief Robinson and Chief Minichello for all they do for our village. And uh, have a good evening. And there thank are you. no questions from uh, the YouTube viewers, which uh, maximum numbers were three people viewing. And there were no, no questions? No questions, but I also put, uh, you can submit a question here or email them to council member Larry Frankel at your email address. So if, if you might get a question, but uh, no, one, no one posted a question on YouTube. Okay. Can, I, can I just say one more thing? Because I think it's important. I was going to mention it and it's not on the agenda. And it is, if Dave's, it, I'm not sure if Dave's still with us or not, but we talked mm -hmm. last year about the Mayfield Road Construction Project. Um, Dave, are you there? Can you give us a, a briefing on that? What's the expected timeline with that? Well, it was, it was scheduled for construction this fall, but um, it's been pushed back to probably spring of next year is what, what we're looking at. So it's still going to take place. And, um, you know, we're really excited about getting that done. It's long overdue. This will be for the intersection of Mayfield and River Roads. And there'll be new signalization there and new signage and we'll have opticoms there. So we can you know, go safety force and get through the intersection more quickly and safely. So um, you know, that's, uh, that's common. We haven't, uh, you know, we haven't forgotten about that. What, what is also, uh, Greg, you may want to mention how they're going to be timing the traffic signals so that people are, um, have more time uh, if they're coming down Mayfield and don't have time to stop and how that signal is going to indicate that. Um, yeah, I don't have all the details on that, Dave. I don't know if you have anything you can add. I know there's supposed to be some, like, what the indicator is or how long that's supposed to last or work. Yeah, what, the, what he's talking about is the preemption, um, I think it's called. So there'll be sensors, um, 
I think in the pavement on Mayfield and, and what it'll do, um, we've had some per, pretty serious or significant crashes as a result of trucks not being able to stop, um, you know, coming through that intersection. And so what it'll do is it'll, it'll monitor a vehicle speed. And if it can tell that it's not gonna be able to stop by the time it gets to the intersection, it will hold the yellow until that vehicle goes through the intersection and then go red. So in other words, cross traffic won't be coming through that intersection. It'll make it a whole lot safer than what, what we've seen in the past. If there's a runaway cement truck, it, there's a chance that it won't be a problem. Exactly, yeah. And we have something on the, the resolutions on for tomorrow night's meeting. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank, good you. Night, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, thanks.